Evening to you, traveller. Once again, you have sought me out so as to hear another one of my many anecdotes. Recently, someone told me dedication to duty is something to be admired. However, this individual also admitted that dedication to duty can often lead to weakness. Come, traveller. Huddle around this fire that I so conveniently prepared, and listen to the tale I call the Station Master's Ghost. Anyone who works on the railway will tell you one of the key elements crucial to the livelihood of a railway are stations. Without stations, passengers would not be able to board trains, meaning they'd be forced to travel by road. The ever essential upkeep of the stations ultimately falls upon the Station Master, and it is their responsibility to see their stations run efficiently and effectively. Unfortunately, there was one station master who took his responsibilities far too seriously. His name was Edmund Jacobs. The only son of an LMS station master, he was a strict, harsh and unforgiving man who treated the regulations as if they were a bible. Many who worked under him claimed he ran his station like a South American dictator, often reprimanding and punishing people for the slightest offences. For instance, if a train was a second late, he would call the crew incompetent and report them for being behind schedule. He even reported crews if their train was a second early. Even the passengers disliked him, as he was often curt and blunt with them, unless of course they were someone of importance, where he showed a little decorum even if it was false. Many staff assigned to his station soon transferred elsewhere, as he found him intolerable to deal with. Once, a workman who witnessed him physically assault a buffet girl for accidentally spilling tea on his uniform made a solemn prediction. That evil man will get what's coming to him. You mark my word. And sad to say, a year later, the prediction came true. Late one night, after the station had closed for the night, Mr. Jacobs was in the middle of what he called his last inspection before heading home for his dinner. It was whilst he was inspecting the fire buckets on the platform that a scrap of paper caught on the wind blew onto the line. To Jacobs, he regarded it as if the wind was daring to disrespect him, and without a second's thought, he leapt down onto the track without looking. As far as he was concerned, there was no need to look, for he'd seen the last train off an hour ago, and the next one would not be due for another two hours. But, I'm sad to say, he was wrong. Unbeknownst to him, a special consignment to the terminus had been scheduled at the last minute. The signalman had received it, and, having observed Edmund Jacobs' inspector tracks earlier, foresaw no reason to halt it, so cleared it through. Seeing Jacobs on the track, and knowing he was going too fast to break in time, the driver of the special pulled hard on the whistle with all his might, but the warning was too late. Station Master Edmund Jacobs was dragged under the wheels of the speeding train. Once the train came to a stop, the guard called for an ambulance and the police, but Edmund Jacobs was declared dead on the scene. Shortly after his death, a new station master was assigned to the station, but a day later, the man quit. Another was immediately found to take his place, but like his predecessor, he too resigned from the position. Months went by, and every time the same thing would happen, and each man would have the same reason. They all claimed to have cited a figure resembling the former station master, Edmund Jacobs, and said the cold and malevolent expression on the man's face chilled them to the bone and filled them with a sense of dread. One man even claimed... It were as if he was warning me it was his station, and if I valued my life, I'd get out whilst I could. Due to the refusal of any man offered the job, and with the other staff too feeling the wrath of Mr. Jacobs, the railway had no alternative but to close the station and let it fall into disrepair. The years passed, and the discovery of the ruins of a medieval fort resulted in an increase in tourism to the surrounding area. Road transportation could not cope due to the number of visitors and the limitations of the narrow country lanes. As a result, it was decided that the station was to be reopened. The fact controller explained this to Henry. I want you to take an inspection crew and I up to the old Harwood station. Its proximity to the medieval form makes it reopening essential to head off it. Harwood station, sir? 
But isn't that the station that's haunted? There are no such things as ghosts, Henry. Edmund Jacob died as a result of a tragic accident and was laid to rest at St. Alden's churchyard. He is not roaming the old station as a ghost. With that said, the fat controller walked back to his car, but Henry was not so sure. Nevertheless, he collected a brake van and met the inspection team at Knapford before taking them to the station. The inspection team dismounted from the brake van and the fat controller spoke to Henry and his crew. I've spoken to the foreman of the inspection crew and we decided we'll insert the old signal box of the old quarry branch line as far as the waterfall. We'll inspect the station tomorrow. And the fat controller walked away. Henry sat short of the platform, steaming away whilst his crew chatted with the guard. All the while, he waited. He kept looking at the old station building. Part of the roof was caving in, and all the windows had been smashed by drunkenly bored vandals. He noticed that squatters had, at some point, tried to make a home out of it, but had seemingly abandoned it, and Henry had a pretty good idea why. Shortly, the inspection team returned. The signal box is in better condition than we expected. A few broken panes here and there, but that's easily repaired. The bridge over the stream isn't too bad, but I'd like to get the bank support rescued sooner rather than later. Can we go then, sir? I suppose so. It's getting dark quicker than I expected, so we'll have to inspect the station and the other buildings tomorrow. And with that, the fat controller boarded the brake van with the rest of the inspection crew. As Henry pulled away, he could have sworn he saw a face move away from the window of the station master's office. The next day, Rosie brought the workmen up to the station so they could look over the buildings. Rosie shuddered as she looked at the station building. It felt like she was trespassing on private property. Her crew decided to take the opportunity to have their lunch and they were just about to bite into their sandwiches when there was an almighty scream and a workman bolted onto the platform from the station master's office. Jerry, whatever's the matter? You look like you just saw a ghost. I didn't see one, but I think I heard one. You heard one, you say? Yeah, I was checking the internal door that leads into the booking office when I suddenly heard a voice in my ear telling me that I was trespassing and I needed to get out if I valued my life. Ha! I've had enough of this. I'm going to show you lot that this ghost malarkey is nothing but rubbish. Pure hornswoggle. With that, the foreman marched into the office and looked around. He was about to exit the office when both doors suddenly slammed violently shut. Then they could hear the foreman screaming in pure terror and what sounded like furniture being thrown about. The workman tried to open the door but refused to budge. Then the door flew open and the foreman scrambled out looking very pale. Shaken by the ordeal, the workman boarded the brake van and Rosie headed back to Knapford. Later that night, she spoke to Edward, who listened intently and with great concern as she recalled the foreman's experience. Oh, it was horrible, Edward. All I could do was stand and listen as that poor man was viciously attacked. Even now, I could still hear his screaming. Speaking truthfully, my dear Rosie, if you could have done anything to help the foreman, I'm sure you would have done it. Now then, you'd better try and get what sleep you can. You have a long day ahead of you tomorrow, I'm sure. <sighs> You're right, Edward, as always. Good night. Good night, my dear. Once the other engines had drifted off to sleep, he quietly made his way out of the yard and on towards the station. It was very dark when he reached the station, and a mist was beginning to settle, making it hard to see. The air grew cold, and an owl hooted. Edward plucked up courage and spoke. I know you're watching me, so you might as well just show yourself. There came no reply. I'm not so easily scared like the others. You can't just watch me from the shadows or throw a table at me like you did with the foreman. Oh, he's okay, if not a little traumatized. Not that you'd really care. Nobody but the owl hooted, and Edward lost patience. Enough of these games, Jacobs! 
Come out here and face me like the man you claim to be, sir! There was another pause, and then the platform door to the station master's office creaked open, and out onto the platform stepped the figure of Edmund Jacobs. The engine and former station master stared coldly at one another. Edward took a breath and began, Don't you think this is a little pathetic? Getting obsessed over a single station? I didn't have the opportunity to meet you when you were alive, sir. And for what I've heard of your person, I doubt I would have wanted to. But putting aside how obsessive you can be, I do believe you ran a very efficient station. Mr. Jacobs said nothing, so Edward continued. But times have changed, Mr. Jacobs. Times tried to change, especially in the wake of your demise. But instead of resting peacefully, as you should be doing, your obsession of this station caused nothing but the undoing of your hard work! Mr. Jacobs took a step forward, and Edward was almost certain that the spectre had actually growled at him like a feral dog would. If you don't believe me, look around you. Despite what you've tried to keep going, your station has fallen into disrepair. But we're trying to change that, and so were the many of your successes that you chased away because you did not like their attempts to improve your station, choosing to see it as an intrusion on the running of your station. Mr. Jacobs was very clearly seething with rage, apoplectic that an engine would dare to have the nerve to speak to him so insubordinately in his station. He stepped forward and raised a fist, but a harsh and booming whistle from Edward stopped him. That's quite enough out of you, Mr. Jacobs! You were a pathetic little man in life, and you're an even more pathetic excuse for a ghost! Leave this station, Mr. Jacobs! In fact, leave this railway forthwith! You're no longer the station master at this station, and you never will be again! Mr. Jacobs stared at Edward, then slowly looked around at what his beloved station had become, before looking back at Edward and slowly dissolving into the mist. Edward stood for a moment of quiet reflection, before slowly puffing back to Tidmouth Sheds. After Edward's confrontation with Mr. Jacobs, the atmosphere at the station seemed different, almost lighter, and the work crews were able to conduct their inspection on the rest of the station without further hindrance. It was discovered that the foundations of the station were too weak, and so it was decided that the station would be torn down and a new one built in its place. As they watched the demolition, Edward spoke to the Fat Controller. Do you really think he's moved on, sir? I can't say for sure, Edward. But if he is not, then I would advise he does so. I do not care for what he thinks, and I admit he was excellent. And I admit he was an excellent, if more than a little harsh, station master. But his contract of employment with this railway ended the moment he died. As far as I'm concerned, the only connection to Mr. Edward Jacobs, or after this station, is the tragic accident that happened here ten years ago. Nobody has seen or heard anything definite of Edmund Jacobs since the reconstruction and reopening of the station. But some still say, when the moon is high and an owl hoots, Edmund Jacobs continues to walk the corridors of the station. As you can see, Traveller, Jacobs clung so hard to what he had done to his station whilst he walked the mortal plain, he unwittingly let his hard work go to ruin. Take heed of my words, good traveller. Be proud of your achievements in life, but do not let them consume you, lest you wind up the same as Edmund Jacobs. Ah, the clock doth toll the hour and summons me back to my work. Step lightly as you walk through the fog, dear traveller, for you and I are not the only thing that inhabits it.